Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting virtual tour with the Foss Waterway Seaport. I am your guide for the evening, Chris Stoddinger, and hello. It's good to see you. I'm glad you guys could make it out for this tonight. I'm very, I'm very excited for this one. I think the free third Thursday program that the Foss Waterway Seaport has, you know, historically done has always been really cool. Uh, and the fact that they just hit the ground running and adapted to doing these virtual ones um, with our honored and humble partner here, Pretty Gritty Tours, is pretty extraordinary. So uh, welcome. I hope you guys are as excited about this as I am. I would be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity to thank everyone involved. So let me do that. Uh, of course, uh, this is a Foss Waterway Seaport production, uh, their historic waterfront museum, which used to be part of the mile-long storage dock facility uh, that was built in the early 1900s down on the Foss Waterway. Uh, they are the last remaining section of that enterprise, and they operate a maritime history museum out of that space. And of course, tonight's presentation is brought to you by Columbia Bank. And to properly thank our sponsor for tonight, we have a brief message from them. I've been a commercial fisherman for 41 years. Truly is a magical place out there. I've been with Columbia Bank as long as this boat's been to sea. As a commercial fisherman, we have income pulses that are directly related to seasonal activities. If that propeller ain't turning, you're not earning. Columbia Bank tailored this loan to fit our business needs perfectly. They made me happy as a clam at high tide. Uh, I would like to also thank our drone videographer, photographer, Nat from uh, Be Good Events Photography for contributing the uh, aerial footage that you get to see tonight, as well as uh, a lot of the interior footage. We actually have some really good stuff of the railroad trusses at the top of the building uh, that he has brought to us. Uh, and if you're looking for more on that, it's begoodeventphotography.com. So lots of, it's just, it's pure Tacoma. It's just such a sweet collection of entrepreneurial do-gooders and people invested in the community getting together to talk about history. And that is pretty much my greatest passion right there. I should also just briefly acknowledge that my four-year-old son was really tense that I might not do this one right. Uh, because while I might be an aficionado on sales, he is hands down the expert on rails. And so he wanted me to have uh, this tonight just to make sure that if I got lost at any point, I would have the proper materials uh, to carry on. He has a one track mind, let's say. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's talk about Tacoma and specifically rails and sales. And you know, if you've been on any of our virtual tours before or been down to the seaport, we've really focused on the sales portion of everything and how uh, the maritime industry here is the, the lifeblood into Tacoma, really. But I would like to make the argument that Tacoma is, from its birth uh, as Tacoma, a railroad town. First and foremost, even to this day, it is exactly a railroad town so much so to the point where i'm convinced that if you were to put your ear to the ground anywhere in the city you would hear the thrumming beat of a steel locomotive uh, coursing through the minds and bodies of every person here maybe a bold claim but i'm seeing if i can back it up here let's uh let's check it out mm. also i just hope to mention briefly this is a live and interactive tour tonight uh if you're watching it right now uh, you have the opportunity to contribute. If you want to ask questions, um, give us some anecdotal background, whatever you want, make this your own, uh, because I frequently rely on the expertise of those who have lived here for a long period of time or those who are transplants that are just equally passionate about the area uh, and would like to, to hand out some of their good knowledge just out of the goodness of their heart. So uh, feel free to comment if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, wherever you are right now, uh, advance the narrative of our great seaport because that's what we're here for. This is our signature shot. We're gonna visit this more than once, but this is looking south, um, essentially down what is now Pacific Avenue there on the right. You can still see Old City Hall 
uh, the North Pacific building, that's the one with the round rotunda up on the top there. And then that's Half Moon Yard or Half Moon Bay originally. And then those structures uh, right along the waterfront down there on the left of this photograph, that is actually the, the mile long grain warehouse. Uh, the last remaining section that we have today is the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum. So it is, um, it is precisely that, Denise. I appreciate you mentioning it. It is a phenomenal picture and I love this one. I think it's really representative of everything that we're talking tonight. But to, to get you the right mind frame, I think if you're looking for like really sweet historic fiction about the railroad progressing across the country, you should look up Hell on Wheels. Uh, it's one of my favorite TV shows ever uh, and follows the construction of the railroad uh, across America. And it's, it's yucky at sometimes, but I'm um, honestly not yucky enough to really encapsulate the true story of that. So look into it. It's good. But as the, the railroad was in this frenzied race to connect East and West coast, uh, you can see this is the North Pacific rail track as it creeps across America there. Uh, and primarily I focused on the, the Washington portion, but this extends all the way across. It wasn't the first transcontinental railroad. Somehow we miss uh, this part in our historic telling all the time, but the Canadian Pacific uh, officially connected East and West coast of North America before the United States did. And they never get credit for it in anything that we ever talk about. So here's to you, Canucks. Mm. Here's a, a little more high relief version so that you can see the Northern Pacific's route as it moved essentially from the Great Lakes to the Puget Sound. And that, that is the, the rails to sails mantra right here, my friends, is that it is and always will be easier to move heavy amounts of freight via water. Uh, it's so much simpler to build and maintain and crew a ship than it is to build a railroad across the country. Uh, and so while the railroad was a phenomenal way to move stuff inland to the water, it was always easier to move stuff via the water. Uh, and so to connect the Great Lakes to the Puget Sound was a huge achievement, um, especially after the construction of the Erie Canal so that you could get a massive tall ship all the way into the Great Lakes. Psh, uh, super, super easy peasy. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Erie Canal's main job was to bypass Niagara Falls, which you may have heard of. And if you've seen The Office, you know what I'm talking about. I'm sad that that's what I have to reference these days, but I can't take anything for granted anymore. <laughs> um, the Northern Pacific Railroad was a, a huge advocate for steam engines like the Mini Tonka here. Uh, this is pretty representative of what you would have seen in the early days. And then it moved on um, from there. And then here we go. Are we looking at, oh, thank you. Uh, this is information to me and I am the first to admit that I was wrong. Uh, Panama Railway was the first to connect coast to coast, then Canadian Pacific. I'm gonna double check on that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt to anyone whose username is Railblazer and uh, have a train as their profile picture. It makes the most sense to me when I'm doing my research out here. Uh, I also want to just talk about as the, the trains were moving their way across the country, they moved on. This was a pretty modern engine uh, at the time. Uh, they started with things like this and I just love this one. This is also one that my son really wanted me to bring up. This is the Do It Clinton. Uh, this is one of the early uh, American locomotives. This was prone to explosions, uh, by the way, which is one of the many reasons that it's no longer in use. But if you're looking for a classy looking train, uh, a series of carriages, you know, pinned together <laughs> behind that bad boy is pretty awesome. When we're talking about railroads today, I think it's easy to think of them as just relics of the past, but they are a constantly adapting you know, organism really. Uh, and the fact that they still continue to operate in and around Tacoma is a huge testament to that success. And the fact that, uh, you know, if you go down to the waterfront of Tacoma, pretty much any time, you're almost guaranteed to see a train and a tremendous amount of goods come in through the port of Tacoma and get shipped out via rail, but also a tremendous amount comes in, primarily grain, uh, which you remember from our previous tours, 
grain comes in, it goes into those massive Temco grain silos, fills up a ship, uh, and then takes off. And to give you some perspective here, um, trains can do the work of like several, several trucks. I think it takes seven long trains, seven long trains fully loaded with grain to fill up an entire grain ship that arrives here in the port of Tacoma. Uh, alternatively, you're looking at, I think, 3,300, 3,300 approximately trucks that it would take to load up that much grain into a single one of those ships, a single one. And Port of Tacoma handles just over 100 grain ships annually was the last one I saw. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on down there. Um, the thing that brought people out was the, the great manifest destiny idea. Uh, and essentially, the United States government, in an attempt to colonize the American West, gave out land grants just like candy, uh, and primarily land grants to the railroad which essentially was like, here's a parcel of land. You are entitled to revenue made off of it while you're using it. Uh, if you find any lumber or minerals on it while it's an active railroad, you can keep those. Um, also, you get essentially right-of-way rights so that if you, know, you sell this to make towns, saloons, any money-making enterprises that are gonna inevitably pop up along the railroad, that's for you guys, but you have to eventually pay it back with interest. And in fact, there was an interesting case study not too long ago that actually proved that all of these railroads had, in fact, repaid their debt uh, to the American government with interest. Um, and it's all been, been taken care of. The big thing that pushed this, this whole thing really aggressively, put a lot of fuel in that fire, was, of course, the, the gold rush in California in the 1860s. Uh, and then people were hungry to connect one side of the country to the other. And so you see just, just tremendous aggressive push to get the railroad out there. And of course, uh, people did it. Now, a lot of people think, why isn't Portland, aptly named, the location where the terminus for this railroad would have been selected? Because a lot of trains um, from California and beyond were already arriving in Portland. Uh, they had a lot of ability to offload goods and then send them out to sea. But a little thing was standing in their way down there at Portland, and it's uh, known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Uh, here's a friendly little shot from a nice day out at the mouth of the Columbia River, which if you're familiar, the Columbia River empties out into the Pacific from Washington, Oregon's border there. Uh, and that section out there is a constantly shifting nightmare landscape, sub aquatic sandbar uh, that is infamous for just destroying both ships and your dreams. Uh, and it was incredibly treacherous. Even today, there's only, I believe, eight or nine certified pilots uh, who will get on board your vessel and navigate it through the mouth of the Columbia so that it can get to a safe harbor um, up the Columbia, which is still used for a tremendous amount of shipping. But uh, a lot of people didn't want, I mean, this is a modern vessel that you're looking at right here. This sucker is just getting obliterated by the mouth of the Columbia. Uh, and, and this is, again, this is the state of the art. This is modern right now. So can you imagine trying to take a fully rigged tall ship in the, you know, 1870s in through the mouth of the Columbia? Uh, it is, it's terrifying. So the powers that be realized that the Puget Sound, uh, immensely deep, all on its own, not requiring really any dredging, uh, and if dredging at all, very nominal amounts, um, and with a very shallow grade became the perfect location for the railroad and Tacoma was the terminus that was selected for that. Hey, well done Tacoma. Now you might think why wasn't it Olympia or Seattle? Uh, Seattle was up for it, but uh, they didn't have what Tacoma had, which was a lot of land that was only owned by the Puyallup, which unfortunately 
uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad and American Congress saw as expendable. So all of that was up for grabs in their opinion, and they could take it instead of displacing white settlers out there. Even so much to the point that Job Carr, early pioneer in the Tacoma area, who established what we call Old Tacoma now, uh, had that all set up and he was ready to reap the profits of having you know, the terminus of the railroad come in there. But the railroad decided to take the land several miles south in what we know of as downtown Tacoma today, or actually closer to the tide flats because they didn't have to do anything about it. They didn't have to pay anyone. They didn't have to ask. They just rolled right in and took it over. And this is, this is the history of the railroad in the area. So let's, um, let's see here. I want to give you guys something to, to look at here because back to our our patrons here, when you're looking at old Tacoma, you really have an opportunity to see just how cool this area was because, um, I'll see if I can make this bigger for you here. That white building with the three chimneys there on the right, that's the Northern Pacific Land Office. And it was the, the grandest building in Tacoma, fittingly enough. This picture is from 1881. And this is when Tacoma was I mean, just looking at it here, you can see it was almost exclusively a city made of wood, a very haphazard for a town that's uh, liable to catching on fire. But uh, of these grand wooden structures, by far the most exquisite, the most well-moneyed and the most appropriately placed with the Northern Pacific Land Office there. And it plays an important but understated role in that they controlled all of the land here. Uh, and that's going to become important later on in our story because of all the corruption, backstabbing, and strangleholds that have been placed on this area, the Northern Pacific Railroad's ultimate control of everything that happened in Tacoma should never be underestimated. They ran this city. Uh, and while the presidency of the Northern Pacific Railroad was a constant game of 13 Dead End Drive of people just shuffling in and out, um, all of the major players uh, were huge in Tacoma. You don't have to look farther than essentially the street names of this city to understand who ran everything down here. Now, this is the building uh, over time. Uh, the Northern Pacific office here eventually when they upgraded their facility, this is what it looked like uh, moving on. I believe it was a boarding house for a period of time, a hotel. It kind of just went uh, down and down there. But it is important because this particular structure uh, bears a very striking resemblance to the Hosmer house. Uh, and the Hosmer house is important because he, like <laughs> everyone else in the area, was connected to the railroad. For my Tacoma people, you might be familiar with the name uh, Charles Wright, Charles Barstow Wright, president of the Northern Pacific Railroad Company for a period of time there. Uh, he's the one who gave us Wright Park, Annie Wright Seminary, so many Wright, 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 so many rights, so many wrongs, actually. Uh, but he was instrumental in the development of this, and his brother-in-law was Theodore Hosmer. Uh, who is the gentleman who's officially responsible for the planning of the city of Tacoma. And he lived in this swanky little abode, which you can see in downtown Tacoma today. It is uh, right across from the Pantages Theater, essentially a little kitty corner in there. And it's interesting because originally the, the front of this home faced eastward down towards the water. Uh, and that over time, when they renovated it, they actually just lifted that whole sucker, pivoted 90 degrees so that it now faced uh, the new roadway that ran in front of it uh, and just continued building the city out there. It is the second oldest structure in the city of Tacoma area. Uh, the oldest goes to the, I think it's 1851, 1852 granary in Fort Nisqually. Uh, and yeah, I'm trying, it's 11th? I think I always forget. It's I think it's eleventh, um, and it's it's right it's right downtown there. It's just next to the original House of Donuts, in name, not the original original House of Donuts, fittingly enough. But 
when you're looking at this, and this is just a, a fun side boat, this is the, the grand vision for Tacoma, by the way. Uh, you can see actually right down there, let's see if I can make this a little bigger for you. Uh, not only uh, the developing waterfront, the beginnings of that mile long grain warehouse, but Stadium High School uh, right down there. And this is when it was still envisioned to be the great luxury hotel for the Northern Pacific. And then there in the shadow of Mount Rainier, you can see the single spire of Old City Hall down there, right across from the Northern Pacific building. Now, <laughs> this is from the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, uh, which happened, oh, yikes, I think 1864, if I'm not mistaken. But this was Northern Pacific propaganda material uh, sent up to Seattle to always remind people that Tacoma was going to be the it spot uh, and that they knew everything about everything. And in fact, this little beauty right here, 1893, uh, is from the, the Yukon Expo up in Seattle and the Northern Pacific <laughs> bankrolled the Yule Like Tacoma sign. So this was up essentially on the north end of Lake Union, I think sort of where like Gasworks Park would be in Seattle today. Uh, and it was a, a light up sign, even grander than the Hollywood sign. And it was set down there just to remind people that uh, Tacoma was what was up. Oh, Jessica, thanks for always coming through for us. It's on 9th. I always assume it's on 11th, but it's on 9th. Um, Google Maps will confirm this for everyone. I'm just going to navigate you through the railroad right now. Outside of that, this is the interesting thing that I want you to see. So um, Olmsted. Um, Frederick Olmsted is a city designer, planner, landscaper, groundskeeper, extraordinaire, an artiste. And this is not a super high res photo, but it is his plan for the city of Tacoma. And you can see that it's this elegant, winding, terraced city um, that moves along the waterfront there and had separate neighborhoods all lined out, was all condensed down to a single area. And unfortunately, uh, he doesn't end up getting the pass by the Northern Pacific Railroad, and this design never comes to be. Um, Charles Wright's brother-in-law, uh, Hosmer, ends up getting it and just establishes a grid system. And I hesitate to even call it that because if you've ever been in Tacoma or tried to navigate it, you'll see that the grid system was sort of a hodgepodge of different grids that as they expanded outwards, kind of got mashed together and not a lot of it makes as much sense as we had hoped. Uh, and this was his first time designing a city. He sort of just took a stab at it. And it's a tragic point in the history out here because the railroad made the decision to abandon this really elegant design, I think in a huge part because of money uh, and create the system of Tacoma that we have today. <sighs> I'm not saying uh, it's right or wrong, but it was a very cool plan. You're absolutely right, Jackie. The other thing that the Northern Pacific Railroad really focused on in the early days is connecting rails and sails. Uh, so this is Half Moon Bay. You can see that they built uh, a spit of land across of it, across it really early on and built the rail line across there. But they realized its potential for a switching yard. Uh, and so as they were developing out there, they, they took over essentially 600 acres of just wetland tideland down there, um, blasted a lot of the cliff to create fill. And unfortunately, this area was uh, a sacred area for the Puyallup Nation. They have a signal stone at the base down here um, that reportedly had a petroglyph on it that was anywhere from 10 to 12,000 years old. Experts disagree on the timeline on that. Uh, and that signal stone, which was a gathering location for a lot of the Salish tribes uh, throughout the year, ends up getting used as fill for the railroad down here as they fill in Half Moon Bay. You can see uh, here they're using this sluicing process. So they're just diverting all of that sediment down the hillside through these tubes, essentially down these sluices, uh, creating more and more fill and stable ground so that they can continue to build the railroad and then the switching yard, giving us the one that we have 
down there today. Now, while Half Moon Bay, uh, later Half Moon Yards, switching yard, uh, isn't as expansive today as it once was, uh, it is still down there and you can take a look at it. So right here, this is right next to the Foss Waterway Seaport Museum. Um, and you can see uh, curving up towards 705, it goes right over the top of it. And then there's the Temco grain facility down there. <clears throat> now inside the Foss Waterway Seaport is a, a beautiful example of that railroad history. And that's one of the things I wanna highlight the most is that as soon as you walk through the door of that facility, there is an incredible uh, display that really talks about the history of the railroad and they do a really cool job of it specifically in making it interactive. Like they have uh, a display where you get to operate a train and try and connect the, the cars in the right order. They also have a reproduction of um, the Half Moon Switching Yard. Uh, and this is entirely uh, a passion project uh, by docent volunteers, Bud and Chuck, who work down in the seaport. And I owe a lot uh, to them in doing the historic research for this as well. But uh, you can take a look inside the building here really quick. Uh, and this is their, their model. Now, it isn't a scale model. They call it a stylized model because I think if they were to have done it to scale, it would be something like 11 feet longer than what it is. Uh, and this, this for me is a bragging point because uh, the, the Half Moon Yard was the largest west of the Mississippi. So great to the point that it dwarfed Seattle's, uh, which could accommodate, I think anywhere from like 400 to possibly 500 full-size rail cars. The Tacoma one, no big deal, could handle a thousand 40-foot rail cars in its heyday. Uh, uh, no big deal. I'll let that sink in for a second. Anyhow, um, as we're cruising around there, I also want to point out the building itself um, because you might have seen it when we were first flying through um, into the building that it is itself, like everything in original Tacoma, a product of the railroad. And because they had these skilled carpenters and engineers who knew how to build railroad trestle bridges, they actually just utilized them to build this grain warehouse out there. And so it's this trestle design, uh, which I can actually see. So as the train comes around here, you get to see uh, this is stylized off of early Tacoma. The, the only structure that is exactly the same. Sorry, I lost your sound there for a second. The trains that are coming through here, as I was saying, these are stylized off of Tacoma and you can see it's in the, basically the same position that it used to be. The, the rail line still runs right outside of that grain warehouse museum uh, the way that it used to. And a cool example of that is in that rail display, uh, they had a model maker come in and make a scale model of the um, seaport building. Uh, and they set that up in there so that you can see the trains coming right up to the side of the building where they could then offload onto the tall ships, heads, rails, meeting sails. What's cool about that is that you walk 
out of the museum at the end of your time there and you get to see that in action like the building is the same as it used to be and the train still functions right outside of it from there really really cool about the whole thing when you're looking at the historic photos you can also see uh, that only a little has changed for example the northern pacific building that one with the round top there that became the headquarters after they abandoned their wooden structure uh, and the clever joke about this is that it was set up, uh, a, well, actually it was built in 1888. Uh, City Hall went in across the street in 1893. Uh, and the argument was always over who was the real power, uh, that you could go down to the corner there to influence the direction of the city, but not necessarily knowing which of those buildings would be responsible for it. And I think that's a telling, a telling story. Because while there was an established city government that was, you know, running things in the city of Tacoma, uh, the fact that the Northern Pacific Railroad was the power and the money and the control down here shouldn't be understated in any way. And the fact that the Northern Pacific Land Company still controlled who came in to the city was the most pivotal part of that whole setup down there. Uh, so much so to the point that one of the most wealthy members of Tacoma's, uh, you know, pantheon, I guess, uh, the Warehouser family actually got all of their land by being connected to the Northern Pacific Railroad. It was a grant uh, given to them. They are, ugh, I think we just did the tour on the Warehousers, the single, if not the second largest uh, private landowner in the United States. And so all the privately owned warehouser land is what they use to harvest the timber uh, for all of their various products that are still sold today. Here's another example for you. You know, you can switch back and forth here. There's the historic photograph of Half Moon Yard. Here is the setup inside the museum. And again, you can see it's done stylized to do its best job to give you that, that feel. And then the steep grade up to where the city is run. This is looking down the track today, down towards the grain storage facility as well. And there we are. Now, what's cool about this photo uh, is that one of the best decisions the seaport ever made, in my humble opinion, was to add this wall of glass. Uh, and this wall has saved the, the museum and the building more than once. Uh, originally, this was a brick firewall. And that brick firewall is the thing that stopped this building, the last of its kind, from burning to the ground in one of the many fires that has claimed the rest of that mile long grain storage. Later though, uh, it wasn't as inviting as you might think. So they got rid of it and replaced it with this glass wall, which allow it just pulls you into the space, which I really like. Uh, and that is now the reason that I think it's so successful down there. Uh, here is, we're jumping through time a little bit again, because this is the Foss Seaport building when it was being used as a grain storage facility. And what you can't see are the rail lines right on the other side of it. But what you can see are the tall ships uh, that come right up to it. And this was the early original way to do it. Uh, as the Port of Tacoma became more established out there, you can see uh, they just moved the rail lines down to the tide flats where ships could come in. Uh, and then the series of cranes could start to load up from there. Uh, with the industrialization of the port, things really started to change. And it, it's fascinating because uh, if you're really just into the history of the area or the port, or you have a kid who's really into trains, you can go down to Port of Tacoma uh, and see the trains coming in uh, and offloading or onloading various amounts of cargo from the ships. In fact, Port of Tacoma has a viewing platform that you can go to and actually see um, from a respectable distance, the ship's getting offloaded down there. It's really cool. When we're thinking about the development of that, I, again, want to show you early Tacoma. This is, you might recognize the Drake building, actually. Uh, it was the home of the Tacoma Night Market. This is on what is now Pacific Avenue, just down from Old City Hall in the Northern Pacific building. And really, when you look at the development of Tacoma, it hinges on the cat. Uh, it hinges on the the power radiating out from the Northern Pacific, essentially. Um, you see it uh, move farther from that headquarters and then down Pacific Avenue with the grandest structures starting there. And in fact, 
Prairie Line Trail, the first real spur of the railroad that penetrated the heart of the city, um, goes right past the Fosswater Way Seaport up into the heart of Tacoma, which is now the University of Washington Tacoma campus. So it, it takes just a brief walk downtown Tacoma to see the fact that the railroad is still woven into the very fabric and mindset of Tacoma. And, and looking at these early photos on how it was designed, it's really easy to see. Um, these are photographs from Wilhelm Hester, a personal hero of mine. He was a photographer who went through the city of Tacoma and captured a lot of the historic maritime goings on around here. Uh, and these are on display at the Foss Waterway Seaport uh, and are really just stunning. This is the first one I'd ever seen from the, the port of Tacoma side, looking up towards what is the Tacoma Hotel out there. You can see the spire of Old City Hall and of course the ever-present uh, Northern Pacific headquarters down there. And just how incredible it was that they could bring a tall ship under power of sail down into what is now the Foss Waterway and then switch it around. Uh, so I got some I got some good stuff here. Yes, thank you very much. I'm glad you're loving the photos. This is really all due to uh, Tacoma Public Library, uh, the Washington State Historical Society, and of course, uh, the Foss Waterway Seaport. And yes, uh, this video will be live afterwards so that you can view it to your heart's delight on Facebook, YouTube, um, and the Foss Waterway Seaport Facebook page as well. So you, uh, you've got lots of options. And this should be trending all the time. Make it happen, people. I need some influencers in this group. When you're um, looking at these historic photos, I want you to really focus on that Northern Pacific building and its prominence there. So this is a cool one because you rarely see the Northern Pacific building without its sister, Old City Hall, dominating the skyline. And they did make it taller on purpose. But um, this is just so iconic of how important the railroad was and at the time it was. I love that you can see uh, the telegraph lines coming in there because the history of the railroad and the history of the telegraph cannot be separated. Uh, the, they grew across the country at the same time and the success of one was dependent on the other. And you can see those multiple line poles jutting down here to the Northern Pacific, which was really the hub of power across the West Coast. Um, and they've got that rotunda up top there so that they could watch the goings and ons from all around. Uh, as it starts to develop here, uh, you see that more and more of the city starts to develop all around it here. And when it gets designated as the terminus out here, um, they they established essentially 3,000 acres south of Commencement Bay and the Prairie Line, uh, which runs all the way up into Tacoma, into the heart of the city itself, actually ran from Kalama originally. Uh, for those of you not familiar, just south on Interstate 5 here is a small town of Kalama. It is named after a gentleman named Kalama who came from Hawaii and established the area. So the more you know. Uh, and then here, this is just a great photo that we have. Um, this is from Andy Cox, who has been doing the Recaptured City Project, uh, where he superimposes historic photographs over modern day ones. So this is of the North Pacific Building down on Pacific Avenue right now. Uh, and you can see how it looked as that streetcar was running past in probably 1889. I think this is what's going on there. Now, just to reinforce my point in case I haven't made it officially enough, how important was Northern Pacific Railroad to the development of Tacoma and its lasting legacy? Well, if you're familiar with this building because of 10 Things I Hate About You, um, or I Love You to Death, I think, with John Cusack. Nope, not John Cusack. Oh, come on, The Matrix, who am I thinking of here? Someone's gonna help me out here. Keanu Reeves, Keanu Reeves, the only human being living who has a standing offer to buy the teapot shaped dive bar known as Bob's Java Jive, historic property here in Tacoma. Whew, thank you, man. I was having a hard time with that. Thank you, Reed. So um, this is Stadium High School. 
It was originally built to be the Northern Pacific Railroad's luxury hotel. And unfortunately, they go bankrupt uh, and they lose out on their ability to finish this project. It gets gutted by a fire and then eventually purchased for a song by the Tacoma School District and turned into the public school, Stadium High School, which we have today. Uh, it is modeled after a French chateau. It is exquisite uh, and it is a huge part of Tacoma's fame today. So much so that in 10 Things I Hate About You, uh, which supposedly takes place in Seattle, Seattle claims this as their own building, which they would. Now, the, the Union Station down here, um, which was eventually a joint project, but pioneered by the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, and still exists as a major icon on the Tacoma skyline today, also a huge part of that railroad project. And now this is designed uh, by the same team of architects that did Union um, Station, or I'm sorry, Grand Central Terminal out in New York. Uh, this opens in 1911 as the main train station in the city of Tacoma. It operates until essentially the uh, 80s is when it's officially done. Uh, ends up being derelict until the federal government buys it, repurposes it, does a historic restoration on the entire thing, down to the copper dome and historic skylight, fills it with Chihuly glass and turns it into a federal courthouse. And we're lucky that they did. What's cool about this now is the Larry Anderson bronze statue out in the front there, which is, um, I think, just so iconic of that sort of manifest destiny idea of people coming out here via rail and establishing this area. Uh, and you really see it represented with the train station there. Now, just looking at the city of Tacoma today, sure, you've got the LeMay Museum, you've got the Tacoma Dome, uh, a lot of these modern structures, but every other building I maintain is something that was brought in by the Northern Pacific Railroad. Uh, and that legacy echoes throughout it. And the best place to learn about it is down at the Foss Seaport Museum uh, because it's, it's juxtaposed right there. It was essentially the beating heart of it. You can step out of the front door and look up to the Northern Pacific office there and just see how influential the railroad was to injecting life out there and still is today. Because again, like I said, so much grain uh, comes into the area, cars come out of the area. And interestingly enough, the main reason that people were so gung-ho about establishing the Puget Sound as a trading port was that it was connected to Asia. Uh, primarily Japan at the time was the one that they were interested in. Uh, and so two things happened as Tacoma was selected to be the terminus because it was essentially like uh, up to a month shorter to get from the Puget Sound to Japan than it was from any of the major ports in California. Uh, the United States of America also went over to Japan and at Cannon Point forced them to open their doors to international trade. And suddenly it was all open and a lot of money was flowing into the city of Tacoma. Um, now here's the thing, this is where things start to get a little bit sadder, I would say. Um, as the Northern Pacific goes through time and time again, these rolling uh, bankruptcies, you know, they're always living just on hope and a song. Uh, eventually things peter out. You know, it's the, the Great Depression of 1893 that really cripples them beyond repair. And while they manage to continue going on through the early 1900s, we're still active in the area for a long period of time. It was never quite the boom towny boominess that we had all expected after being selected as the terminus in the 1870s. Uh, and a lot of that juice ends up going over to, you guessed it, Seattle, which is unfortunate, but true. Um, Seattle ends up taking a lot of the claim to fame. And so what's left behind in Tacoma are these relics, um, you know, train benches uh, or examples. This is uh, old engine number nine. This was the most iconic steam engine at the time working for the Northern Pacific Railroad, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, super powerful engine there. And it was, it was pretty modern. Some things that the railroad brought to the country, not just to Tacoma, uh, are standardized time zones. Uh, before the railroad, you know, it was, it was just chaos. 
Uh, and it was in, I think, 1883 that the railroad standardized that there'd be East Central Mountain in Pacific times. Uh, and they were they were alone in that. They pushed it, but people were like, I don't want to do that. That seems dumb. And it wasn't until it was congressionally approved in 1918, uh, the, I think the Standard Time Act, that that became a nationwide event that people were, were following all across the way. Um, the, the Northern Pacific Railroad building, which is now the One Pacific building, is privately owned and they use it for um, individual office lease space. Uh, and we have not been invited to uh, give any tours of that building. Uh, but the history of it is something that's certainly on the table there. Uh, not just standard time zones, but uh, also a lot of advancements in safety uh, came out of steam brakes. Uh, steam braking was something that was developed for trains. Uh, beforehand, you just had to have someone essentially on the back of the train on the roof, and they would have to apply a series of brakes to help slow that entire sucker down. It was treacherous and deadly, uh, almost as much as connecting train cars. Uh, before the, the knuckle couplings uh, that you've probably seen, if you've seen trains, uh, they did uh, like a dropping a pin in. Uh, and it was not uncommon for people to be crushed to death as they would get in between the train cars to drop that pin, like something would knock one of the train cars and you get smushed. Uh, so a lot of these safety developments came out of the development of the railroad, but none as exciting or pervasive and ubiquitous as the standardized time zones that we use today. When you're looking at this building and its connection to the railroad, I think I want to encourage you guys to, if you're going out to explore this area, uh, consider walking up because the Prairie Line Trail uh, is now an interpretive trail, actually. Uh, and while it runs all through the University of Washington Tacoma campus, it actually goes all the way down to the waterfront as well. And I think fittingly enough, uh, my favorite art installation on it is uh, the where rails meet sails section. And where rails meet sales was a slogan pioneered by the Northern Pacific Land Company uh, and Railroad to encourage people to come out to the area, uh, essentially, and to spend their money here uh, and to help develop it. And they got final approval as to which businesses showed up out here. So they were really trying to hustle people out here. Uh, this is just, a, I think, a cool installation because I love that they've used the, the rail tie there. I think I can get this up for you here uh, as a needle. A, a, a canvas needle there stitching everything together. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah, here we go. This one is, whew, I'm trying to remember the specific artist name. All along the interpretive trail, there is a series of um, different pieces of artwork representing um, the Puyallup Nation's role in essentially maintaining their ancestral lands out here. Um, and then the development of the area beyond that and everyone's sort of hand in how this area has been created today. But the mural that's been painted up here has a lot of the um, promotional slogans that were used by the Northern Pacific as it was out there developing uh, the area, trying to get people to come out. And I don't think I've ever, I, ah, I missed it somewhere here, but someone asked a question about the, the Northern Pacific's logo, which I think you can see. <clears throat> it's the 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 yin yang symbol here, I think more appropriately known as the molad, uh, which is that balance of forces. And this was obviously an Asian symbol originally, but an executive for the Northern Pacific Railroad saw it at the Columbia Global Expo. Uh, and was like, Oh, man, I like that. And so they adopted it as their symbol. Uh, so much so that you still see it throughout the country today. In fact, in Wallace, Idaho, uh, there is a interpretive museum there today that used to be the train depot for the railroad moving through there. Um, and it still has the, the yin yang, the molad symbol out there uh, and bricks from Stadium High School. Uh, the entirety of bricks uh, that make up the exterior of the Stadium High School building were repurposed 
uh, from ballast bricks brought in by predominantly Chinese vessels uh, and used for the exterior of that. And after the Northern Pacific Railroad went broke uh, the first time, they repurposed a lot of those bricks to build that train depot out in Wallace. And again, in Missoula, uh, they have another one out there and they look obviously identical in the brick, not in the grandeur of that building. Uh, but you'll see that that symbol all throughout. And in fact, if you go inside Union Station, even today, um, in the windows behind all the Chihuly glass is still that original symbol out there. It's pretty fascinating. Reed coming to my defense, as always. Uh, really good stuff out there. So, where did things go wrong? Well, I think it's it all comes down to our relationship with Seattle and really our relationship with the railroad. Now, it would be wrong of me to give you the impression that the exclusive way that Seattle rebounded from the great uh, economic you know, collapse of the 1890s uh, was by bringing in a steam vessel uh, with over a hundred of the finest East Coast hookers that they could and capitalizing on the tremendous amount of people coming down via ship from the Yukon laden with gold. Uh, but I'd also be wrong if I didn't at least encourage you to think that that was a big part of Seattle's success rebounding. Um, one of the most famous madams in Seattle is actually young Mary Conklin. Uh, she washed up in Seattle after her husband, who was a sea captain, died at sea and the entire ship went down. Uh, and she ends up establishing one of the most infamous, uh, but also well-loved brothels in the city of Seattle and was a big proponent to driving that sort of gambling uh, den of sin down there. And in fact, this is just a great one. Uh, this is, uh, at the time, it was the world's largest known brothel. Uh, and this was in 1911 that Mayor Gill and Police Chief Charles Wappy Wapperstein <laughs> Uh, were caught conspiring to the construction of this 500 room brothel. Uh, both of them were brought to justice and the enterprise was shut down, but uh, dream big, I guess. So yeah, I'm gonna push half the narrative that Seattle managed to flourish as Tacoma diminished when uh, the, the railroad sort of hit bankruptcy and then Seattle made a lot of money, let's say, as a large port town where people had gold and could find adult entertainment. We're going to call that where sales meet sales. Uh, but I think it would be more appropriate and more historically accurate to really say that Tacoma was hoist by its own petard. We, we missed out on a lot of the glory because the, the great economic engine of Tacoma was the railroad, but it was also the bottleneck to everything. And so while uh, people could just come into Seattle via ship uh, and create anything they wanted, essentially, uh, everything still had to be passed through the Northern Pacific Railroad until much later in Tacoma's history. Uh, and they were clinging to this dream that the Tacoma was going to be the end all be all stop for everything. And things that they didn't realize were that it was easier to get from the, the Yukon territory to Seattle. Uh, and then you didn't have to worry about trains necessarily. And um, one big thing that they were counting on is that ships wouldn't come all the way around Cape Horn. They were always just going to come overland from the Great Lakes. But after the Panama Canal was constructed, uh, everyone who was betting that it would only be U.S. military vessels allowed through lost a lot of money because, in fact, all vessels were allowed through the Panama Canal and it became just as affordable to leave the East Coast via ship and then come up. And, of course, at this point, Seattle was a much closer port. Tacoma still uh, stuck it to Seattle a few times, though. Uh, after Tacoma became the terminus, uh, and we had this grand train station built down here. Uh, no one wanted to continue building the train line up to Seattle. So just sort of a rinky dink, one track was built up to Seattle and the train would go um, forward facing up to Seattle. And then when it was gonna come back to Tacoma, it would go backwards. They just reversed the whole way down. 
uh, and it was uncomfortable, unpleasant, and dangerous. And so a lot of the people operating it would just be like, nah, we're not going to run today. And so there wasn't consistent rail service uh, back and forth. Now, after Portland really gets connected to Tacoma and a lot more goods are coming into Seattle, things start to change and they're like, all right, we'll build a roundhouse up in Seattle so we can at least turn that sucker around, send it back down. But Tacoma was like, oh, you know what? Here's the thing. Um, by the time the train arrives from Seattle to Tacoma, all our trains going to Portland have left. And so Tacoma forced people arriving from Seattle to stay overnight in Tacoma before they could move on to Portland and vice versa. If you were arriving from the South, from Portland, you had to spend the night in Tacoma before another train would leave up to Seattle. And I love that Slytherin ingenuity. Well done, Tacoma. Uh, and this, this continued for quite a time until eventually the prominence uh, of Seattle really started to move the gears, let's say, uh, and things moved out. The fact that Tacoma is where it is today, though, shouldn't be misrepresented. Um, I think a lot of people assume that the Port of Seattle is the larger and more important port. But in fact, uh, while the Port of Tacoma started out with 240 acres uh, of land and a naturally deep water port, uh, which was a little more successful than the one up in Seattle. Uh, it now owns more than 2,400, uh, so 10 times more than they used to. Uh, and it's used as the main shipping terminal. Uh, 2,400 acres in comparison to the Port of Seattle's 500 acres that they have uh, today, no big deal. But I should also say, in the interest of brokering peace throughout everyone here, uh, they are both now part of the Northwest Seaport Alliance, uh, which was actually established in 2014. So while they are separate ports, they are under essentially the same entity. They operate marine terminals to both ports uh, as a single entry. Uh, and we're, we're doing a lot of teamwork there. Uh, but I think it was reported that more than 3.5 million 20 foot equivalent units are handled by the two ports uh, annually, which is Pretty extraordinary. That's a ton of cargo moving through the area there. So when we're thinking about everything going on down here from this time where tall ships graced the coast of Tacoma uh, to, to today, the best way to go down and see it, I'll repeat, is in the Foss Waterway Seaport, looking into this building under these, these single timber trestles that construct the upper original part of that building that were made by the hands of these railroad workers that brought life to this city. Um, you can stand with one foot in the past, one in the present when you're down there, uh, looking out onto the waterfront from their front porch and then back into the building where they have that sweet train display, which again, if you have a four-year-old into trains, highly recommend. Uh, and it's still easy while you look at this building to remember in your imagination uh, what it used to look like. So with that, uh, I want to remind you guys that if you enjoyed your tour uh, and you would like to tip your guide, you can do that. Uh, my name is Chris and there is a PayPal link on the front page of prettygrittytours.com. Uh, gratuities are always deeply appreciated but never expected. Uh, but I really want to just thank uh, the Foss Waterway Seaport for continuing to offer these free uh, virtual tours to the community uh, and of course to Columbia Bank for making this possible to reach out to the community uh, and embrace our history as we look forward to the future uh, and we are we are looking forward to it. So if you guys have questions please leave them in the comments below we continue to answer them as time goes on. Uh, the Foss Waterway Seaport is a tremendous resource of just information, wit, and charm, and they are always interacting on their Facebook page and will be happy to answer your questions, uh, as well as point you in the direction of where you can get more materials, or if you're looking into those Wilhelm Hester historic maritime photographs, uh, that's something worth looking into there as well. But uh, I believe our next one on October 15th uh, are pococks or rowing vessels, and specifically how 
the the American group out of University of Washington defeated the Nazis in the 1930s. So if that's not a compelling hook, I don't know what is. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys for joining me tonight. I encourage you to keep on exploring. I'll see you soon.